Right. Okay, welcome to Music, <laughs> Philosophy, and More, episode number six. Uh, I'm your co <laughs> I'm not your co host. I'm your host, <laughs> John Henry Sheridan. <laughs> My co-host, Lou LaRocco, and my very special guest today, Lonnie Friedland. Hello, everybody. Yeah. So we're back for a uh, surprise uh, part two interview that we thought uh, would this would be part one, but uh, our beta test, which we are famous <laughs> for, actually, um, went a little long the other night to two hours, so we called that part one. Um, and we got so much good... I thought a lot of good uh, topics discussed and insights from Lonnie that I didn't want to just erase it into oblivion. So uh, I'll post repost that onto Facebook. Uh, sorry, onto YouTube as it exists already on Facebook. All right. So um, so once again, the spirit of music philosophy and more is just to get together with people, uh, friends, old friends, new friends, and uh, learn about their lives through a series of questions and also, you know, uh, hang out and as a, in a communal setting, you know, people can chime in and, um, we can create some positive, uh, you know, positive atmosphere amongst the many struggles and potential dark things that are going on in our times. So let's get right to it. So Lonnie, um, I'll just give you a brief introduction as a, uh, a friend from my early college days and uh, someone that I've seen uh, take the um, the root of becoming a singer songwriter and a, and a rock singer and then a uh, family man and all the while being a very cool person. Um, so that's my very uh, casual introduction, but if you'd like to say a few words about yourself and uh, you know, where you came from and where you are now, and then, then I'll start uh, the interview. Sure. Uh, I think that was good. You, you nailed it. Um, Brooklyn, born and raised. I uh, live in Staten Island now, um, but uh, Brooklyn's always in my heart. And, um, yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, it's music, it's family, and it's uh, not much else than that. You know, your, your friends, your family, and your passion. So I think uh, that was a good intro. Cool. Yeah, thank you for for keeping it simple, and you yeah. know, everyone could relate to that. I think. So um, I'm going to just jump right in. We covered some of this in the previous interview. So anything you feel like you want to just skip ahead, just let me know. Sure. Um, but can you briefly tell us, since we might have discussed it last time, what got you into music in the first place? What were some of your earliest inspirations? Just to kind of bring us up to speed sure uh so you know people sometimes say did you come from a musical family and i think what they mean by that is like you know did your dad play guitar and your mom play the saxophone and in that capacity no you know i didn't come from a music a musical family um there was like a great great uncle through marriage that was in like a jewish klezmer band something like that and uh, my uncle played guitar but um didn't uh he, he passed away young, so nothing ever came of it. So there was no one around me that actually played an instrument or, you know, that I could look to. I can remember my my other, a different uncle at one point had a guitar in his hands when I was really young, and he was playing it in the room, and I was just, like, transfixed. Like, it, it was like magic in the air, you know? Um, but music was always around. So while I didn't come from a musical family in terms of performance, we were a really musical family. So if you were in the car with my dad, Q104.3 was on, right? and probably actually 20, 30 years ago. I think it was, it doesn't really matter, but I think it was like 102.7 when we were kids. It was classic rock. So it was, it was Led Zeppelin. It was Jethro Tull. It was Cream. And then if I was in the car with my mom, uh, to this day, my mom is like super into current pop music. So like whatever's new. Like you don't really catch my mom listening to like old oldies or doo wop. She'll be like, "Yeah, you know, I really like this new Maroon Five song." Uh, so, hmm. uh, growing up with with that, it was like this good grounding in classic, you know, contemporary music, and then pop music, um, and 
you know, but then at, at the same time, both of them really, really like 50s doo-wop. So there was a lot of 101.1 in the car when you were going for long drives as a family. Uh, you get the 50s and 60s stuff. Um, so it was just like a good mix of influences and everybody loved music. You know, if it was time to clean the house, the radio was the first thing to turn on and then the cleaning supplies came out and you kind of danced around while cleaning. Um, it was just music was always there. Um, one of my earliest memories is we had a broken broomstick and I shoved it into the couch cushions and I had those plastic red guitars that most little little boys have and made my mom sit through a pantomime of Footloose. <laughs> Footloose, right? So, you know, from day one, I wanted a guitar in one hand, a, a microphone in the other, and, you know, to have people staring at me. So, <laughs> You know, anything more specific than that, a lot of Billy Joel um, was going on in the house. And um, I can remember my dad putting on Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin. And I, oh, yeah. ran, I run, ran from the room in fear. You know, yeah. like, what is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so it was just music was just always so, so there and so important. Um, so I definitely wanted it, you know, wanted to be a part of it. And then... It wasn't until like 14, 15, 16 that I was like, I, I, I want to be a part of it. I, I don't want to just listen to it. I want to be a part of it. And, you know, that whole journey started. And I'm sure we'll get to that. That's part mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Wow. Great. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, it is fun. Uh, I think a lot of times you'll hear people explain their beginnings and it'll kind of, you'll start at the, uh, <clears throat> at the 14, 15 year time, year old time when they decided to pick up the guitar or whatever. But, uh, it's interesting to see what happened when, when someone was a baby or an infant or, or a toddler or just a kid, how it, you know, you had a positive relationship to music because your family loved music. Yeah. And that, that definitely plays into it. You know, there's no way around that. That must, that's very significant. Yeah. So, uh, I'll follow that up with, um, uh, well, I want to go on tangent a little bit. Um, so you said you had the mic, you want the mic in one hand, the guitar in the other, and to have people looking at you. And I, I can relate to that. Um, I had a similar thing feeling growing up. But uh, so would you think it? Would you say? Would it be fair to say that you were chasing the rock star dream for a portion of your youth? Yeah, yeah, it's fair to say, and it's almost hard to say it now because. The last thing anybody with that dream ever wants to say is that I'm done with that dream. It didn't make sense and I had to move on. It hurts. I don't care if you're 60 years old, you still kind of feel like in the back of your head, like maybe someone's going to hear this and, mm -hmm. and save the day. But yeah, I mean, that, that certainly was the dream. I mean, which as an adult or more of an adult now, when I look back at the dream, I think, well, gee, you know, if that was your dream, you maybe could have been more proactive and, and intelligent about it i think that and we kind of talked about this the other day but you know you're always waiting for like these moments that you read about in, in magazines like i was just walking through the mall and they stopped me and asked me to be an actor and uh, i was <laughs> on the street and they pulled me over and said why don't you make a record right so i just kind of always felt like if i keep playing and i do a show a lot and i and and we keep performing one day there's going to be a guy there that's gonna you know say come with me kid when in reality, you know, you have to be, and, and I know this is not you, you were a lot more proactive than I was. Um, but in retrospect, I do wish that I had been more proactive in the business end of it uh, and, and less pipe dreamish about it. Hmm. Cool, cool insight. Well, I'm pretty sure that anybody who knows you uh, and who has encountered you in your life or what will be said of your obituary or whatever, it's going to have to do with that he was a musician and he was a singer and he was a songwriter yeah. and what, you know, what more do we really need, you know, than to just leave our legacy behind and all the memories that are with you. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many more than just musical memories with, with ones close to you, but sure. I think a whole lot of people are going to remember you for the music you gave, you know, to the world. So nice thought. Yeah, no, I, I mean it. Um, so uh, let's see. So what, I remember uh, before you were in a rock band, 
So I, help me straighten this out. Did you, were you writing songs and performing songs as a singer songwriter before you were in a rock band or just kind of writing songs and getting, getting into it? Yeah, I, um, I was writing songs from the moment I had a guitar in my hand. So that was one of the first things I did. And whether that was because I wasn't as, you know, great enough to play other people's songs um, or it was just because that bug was inside of me, probably like a mixture of the two. I knew from the start I wanted to write. There was no question that I ever wanted to like play guitar and be in a cover band. Like to this day, I could probably go on like bandmix.com and find like a Pearl Jam cover band or something and have a great time. But it was never what I wanted to do with this. I always wanted to make original music. So um, I think I started, I don't know if I started writing words before I had the guitar or really close in proximity, but I started writing words around 1995, 1996. Just started writing my feelings, started trying to put them into um, formats that could be lyrical and um, ended up convincing my parents to get me a, a cheap guitar, learned a few chords, and then I, I had written maybe 10 songs, you know, maybe. And, you know, in retrospect, pretty crappy ones but the first batch and then i remember it was you actually so you had a gig at bar b on like avenue b or something in in the city and for some reason you weren't able to fulfill the commitment and you had asked me if i wanted to take the spot for you and i said yeah and i don't know if you knew but that was my first gig ever i had never played <laughs> gig before and from what i remember there wasn't really a stage i think there was like a sitting area and then a bar and so I was in the sitting area and then people were in the bar and had a few friends from high school and college come, not too many. I don't think I promoted it much. And, and you'll find, I have a history of sometimes not promoting stuff because I almost want to just see how bad I'm going to bomb before I invite anybody. <laughs> uh, and I did my set and I did a few originals. I think my sister was there too. I did a few originals. Uh, and I remember I did uh, one by you two. I did Jealous Guy by John Lennon. I think I did If You Could Only See by Tonic. And then the rest were originals. And so I did that. And then I did that for a couple of years. You know, I think I bounced around, you know, different bars and places. And then met up with the, the Dirty Mother Nation guys. And that was when, you know, it got more legit. And we played a lot of shows. And then playing shows with them also gave me enough courage to start booking my own shows so i would end up doing some stuff on an off weekend of my own or you know whatever hmm. okay yeah so i kind of was just just vaguely aware of how that came together but definitely not the details and i i vaguely do i do remember offering you that gig um i wouldn't have remembered it if you didn't say it uh and that's great i i don't know if you told me this is my first gig or not yeah, you might have but uh I'm just so glad that uh, <laughs> I'm glad you you were willing to take it. I was probably uh, eager to, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm glad that was a good moment for you, you know, and you're, and you're stepping one of your stepping stones. Yeah. Um, so now you're in a rock band. So can yeah. you share about your overall experience being the lead singer of a rock band in the 2000s? And there's a lot of little yeah. mini questions within yeah. that. Do you, want, do you want to hear the story of how it happened or just kind of feedback on how what it was like in general? Um, yeah, no, they, not the story. We can okay. get to that. This is more so, like your yeah, yeah. experience uh, as a lead singer. Let's say someone else wants to be a lead singer. What would you tell them? You know, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, it's work. It's, it's a job. You know, it is a job. Uh, and I don't know if I knew that at first, but it became apparent after a while. Um, you know, one of the things about being in a band is you're now responsible to other people. It's just like a business or a family. You know, I can't wake up tomorrow and say, you know what? I don't want to go to work anymore. I don't really care. Uh, let these kids feed themselves. Let my wife figure out the mortgage and I'm done. I don't care. No, you have responsibilities to people. You know, we all have a role to play. So when you get into a band, you know, maybe day one, you're like, all right, I got to sing. But day two, you're like, we got to get along. We have to have a common goal. We have to figure out what we want from this and what we're going to accomplish from this. Um, 
I got to hold up my end of the bargain when it comes to writing, when it comes to performing, when it comes to gigs, when it comes to packing and unpacking. Right? So it's, it's just a lot more than, than singing, you know? So I think that that, that was kind of eye opening. And then we talked a little bit about the other day, you know, if your question is specifically in the two thousands, it was a weird time for music. We talked about how the industry was changing, but I was also thinking since our conversation, not only was the industry t- changing, but music was really changing. Um, we were certainly not a new metal band at all, right? Dirty Mother yeah. Nation, not new metal, but especially in Brooklyn, everything was metal. I mean, every <laughs> had a seven string guitar or was tuning down to B. It was called the and hardcore scene. It was just unreal, man. And I certainly felt like way out of the loop on that because I was not a screamer or, a, you know, I was not like Jonathan Davis or, you know, I hate to even say Fred Durst or like, you know, it, it, that just wasn't my thing uh, at all. So I also felt very out of the loop with that. And then as that was kind of eclipsing and being replaced, what it was being replaced with was something that was like very lo-fi. I remember it was... um the strokes it was um jet you know are you gonna be girl like stuff like that and that mm-hmm. was also very much not dirty mother nation so i think you know there was an, an element of feeling like just time wise where do we fit into all this because we're not that and we're not this and maybe we're something that's next but i don't it doesn't seem like that was what it was mm-hmm yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess now that you mention it, like I, I kind of forgot the Brooklyn hardcore and metal scene, even though I know that was real, because I don't, I didn't connect to it much, you know. Like so, like I'm connected to you and the Dirty Mother Nation guys a bit, you know. I see them on Facebook, but not a lot of the other the seven string guys for whatever reason, you know. Yeah. I guess I'm more the singer songwriter, pure song based, let's say, than the technical based. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> I just want to take a second to ch- check in with Lou. Lou, I see you've been a little active there. We got any questions coming in, or uh, we have still a few smirks along the way. I don't know. We if have two questions funny. that that came in, and I believe that I got um, Lonnie's friends in finally. So I was okay. able to yeah. mess with the settings, and then um, they had found the video from a couple. Of, they found the beta test, and they thought they mm-hmm. were in, and they commented. So I made sure to reply to the both of them and give them the link to this feed. Um, and that beta test will be up anyway, so they can watch it at a later date. Um, so, yes. And we also have uh, Mark Hamill from the After Hours show asks, uh, what's your guest's website? Oh, sweet. And Daniel Douglas said too many, I guess, when he, when referring to memories. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I, I, don't, I don't have a website to promote if that was the question. I, I uh, you know... I'll be music is not my profession at this point. Music is my passion and my hobby, uh, but I don't have a website. I don't have a recording I'm promoting. Um, if you're looking for something, make a, make a nice donation maybe to frontline doctors or people in need right now, things like that. But I don't have a website. Right. Well, Blani, you do, you do go on Facebook and perform regularly, right? So I do. yeah, people. So, what something happened where well we all know what happened coronavirus happened and we were all kind of shut in for a while and uh, i'm a bit of a an in, i'm not gonna say an introvert because i think people will scoff at that but i uh, i do i maybe a homebody might be a better way of saying it i, I don't mind i don't mind quarantine <laughs> I, no. I, could, I, I could do this for the rest of my life <laughs> um, but i was playing songs and i was like you know there's no live music maybe this is a time to do something different. So I posted a couple of songs and then it, it did hit me like, if you're going to do something, do it with a purpose. And that was when I, I said, you know what, uh, if you make a donation to charity, I'll cover any song you want, period, any song you want. And, you know, some people had fun with it. And, and I, I ended up doing, I feel pretty from West side story as one of them. And, uh, you know, other people just requested songs that they loved that they wanted to hear. Um, but it did turn into something really special. And um, I think, I mean, even, you know, whether the donation part lasts or not, I'll, I'll keep posting music. So feel free to, to friend request me and, and listen in. Cool. So just look for Lonnie Friedland at, on Facebook. Yeah. I think Dr. Douglas already uh, sent them to the Dirty Mother Nation shows in the comments. Oh, okay. Section. Yeah, cool. Yeah. 
I don't know what you're going to find there, but you can go there. <laughs> <laughs> or the website of a defunct band, but you're more than welcome to look around. Sure. And, and do you have a uh, a YouTube page or or no? I, I seem to think... It's not an active one. I, I so... do have one, but it's been kind of off and, off and on. I, I, I regret when I started this whole thing that I didn't post stuff to YouTube and then share it on Facebook. I just posted everything directly to Facebook, and then it's hard to go back from there. It's hard to pull it from Facebook to YouTube. That's more technically difficult. So I kind of regret that. So maybe maybe in the future I will think about you know turning it around into a YouTube thing. But you know, like once again, like the whole aspect of making it a business or something doesn't turn me on. You know, so right, as, right. as long as people get to hear it and they're enjoying it, I, I feel satisfied by that. Cool. Yeah, that's great. I'll just mention on a technical note for for your sake, if you do do that or anyone who would consider that is um, posting something on YouTube and then promoting it on Facebook is it's like you might as well just uh, throw it in the in the garbage because uh, Facebook doesn't want to promote anything from YouTube. Uh -huh. So it's really good to post videos directly to YouTube uh, to Facebook. So okay. your strategy is working good. Okay, I'm sure it's working good for you if you just want people to enjoy it. Right. If you want to expand that, I would say take those original files and just post them to YouTube as well and just let them live there. Right. You know, okay. You don't yeah. have to promote it on Facebook or because. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'll tell you this. I, and I'm going to skip ahead, right? Because uh, one of your questions was, you know, what is a musical aspiration at this stage in my life? Um, so I feel like it t kind of ties into what we're talking about. Before I die, I need to record some kind of album. You know, whether it's eight songs, 10 songs, 40 songs, three songs. I've never done a solo acoustic real recording or it doesn't not maybe acoustic, but a solo recording. I've never done that. So that that is something that, um, you know, before my time is done, I, I need to get done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I would I would like to see that happen for sure. Um, I kind of like I guess I know it because I would have heard about it if you did one, but. I almost feel like you have, but I guess, yeah, you know, just because I've uh, heard your music so long yeah, over the years. Yeah, we put a song up here and there, but nothing ever official. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the world is definitely hungry for your music to be officially released, and please don't be a perfectionist about it. Just do it. So I have um, I have both <laughs> put up the Spotify link and the um, Facebook link to Dirty Mother Nation into the conversation, and... Mark Hamill had also asked if he could perform live with any artist, past, present, or future. Who would it be? Not Louis LaRocco. <laughs> I didn't. I have no. I'm just surprised that, that Dirty Mother Nation's on. On did you say on Spotify? I'm finding you everywhere. There's even Dirty Mother Nation on UltimateGuitar.com. I don't. That I know. I don't know for that. That's hilarious. You're on eBay. <laughs> um, that's that I actually know what you're talking about. It's the moment the soap bar, right? On eBay. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, everything you are, the cords and tabs are on uh guitar.com, ultimate guitar. You know, in case Beautiful. Them, I can't imagine what <laughs> wants to, you know what he teaches, and so I think sometimes he teaches his students DMN songs and they want to learn them. That's awesome. Nice. Yeah. I, I'm sure there's more residue of Dirty Mother Nation on the internet than level six, our Lou and my band. Yeah. Uh, I'm, oh, we like let it ready. crumble. Yeah, we just let the <laughs> cookie crumble. <laughs> like Egyptian ruins, just <laughs> goodbye. So the question was, uh, yeah, who do who would I want to perform with? I think what I'm having trouble with this question is, is like, there's the people I'd want to be a fanboy over, and just be like, oh my god, I'm on stage with this person. And then there's right. people I, as a musician would want to, you know, so like fanboy. I mean, like. I mean, if Eddie Vedder ever wanted someone to, to jam with, that'd be fun. Although I don't know why two baritones would be useful. <laughs> um, uh, you know, obviously being in the presence of Chris Cornell would be amazing. Um, David Bowie, um, Led Zeppelin. But the, like, I just picture what the hell would I be doing with them? You know, like what would they need me for? Um, but that's a, you know, now, so let me give you an answer. I guess, um, there's just some people that I think about like, boy, if they weren't famous and I could get them to play on my solo album, that'd be pretty cool. Um, I think um, Jeff Amin from uh, Pearl Jam as a bass player. I love melodic bass players. I love mm -hmm. uh, people who, who have been, uh, John Entwistle. Uh, Jack Bruce from Cream, great bass player. Um, yeah, 
I can't say I've, I've thought about that question very much, though. But, you know, I, I, I just feel like I, they're, they're fine. They're, they're, they're doing okay without me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, my friend Tom Scuderi asked me a similar question recently, like, who would your dream band be? And uh, it's tough. It's a tough one to answer. You know, of course, then you think my, I always think just the people I've played with and I don't think about the celebrities because you know, like, what do they need me for type of thing? But um, <clears throat> anyway, yeah, cool. That, that's uh, that's fun. Thanks really for the questions, Mark. Just really quick. I, I would say in a lot of ways, not to be a cop out, Paul, Dan, Matt, and Sean. Mm-hmm. I, love, I love playing with them. Uh... And, and, I, and I miss playing with them. And what I miss a lot is, you know, writing to what they wrote. There was something, there's been a lot of people I've met over the years and they'll send me a track and be like, hey man, you want to sing over this? And I'm like, no, I don't. (laughs) I don't want to sing over this. But sometimes when Dan or Paul or Sean would come out with a nice riff or something, or especially when they kind of hit on it together and I'm like, oh, let me get the mic, let me get the mic, you know? And I miss that that feeling because when you're on, on your own in the room, it, it's harder when you when you have other people throwing something at you like i never would have gone there and i like it that's cool I, I like that answer because uh you would you would hope that the guys in zeppelin or beatles or whatever if you asked who do you ideally want to play with it they would say each other you know they wouldn't say right. someone else right, right. yeah uh, yeah. I, I, i'm dmn reunion is always on the table for me mm-hmm yeah, I know. I noticed you guys were flexible with that, like when you did the Sandy Hurricane Sandy yeah. show, right? You got yeah. back together for a greater cause. That was inspiring. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, okay. so I'm gonna jump in. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the story of Dirty Mother Nation? Uh, not this, you go about it however you like. Um, that so Dirty Mother Nation was the band that Lonnie was a rock singer of, lead singer of. It's a rock band. Uh, can you tell us, like, when, what years was the band active? Where did you rehearse? Where did you perform? Yeah. How did you promote? Uh, Just uh, give us a taste of it. Yeah. So, uh, well, so basically, it started out with two brothers and uh, a guitarist that they had found. So, by the time I got onto the scene, three fourths of the band was already in place. So, Matt and Dan are brothers. Matt plays the drums. Dan plays bass. They grew up in a musical family. They had a big brother who was a brilliant, brilliant musician that was really tragically lost. Um, fantastic guy, amazing family. The Douglases are one of the most amazing people you'll ever met, meet. Um, and they had already met Paul and were jamming. And Paul was, Paul is a brilliant guitarist. I mean, I, I would, he's one of the few people I would, I put in the same category as John, where like, you know, it's almost like they could play anything. You, you, they don't really think about it too much. It, it's very quick, the connection between their brain and their fingers. You know, I might be thinking like, what's the third of this? Co-? You know, and they're just like, um, you know, so walking into that room, uh, well, I think, well, I guess to back up, I, uh, I think I had answered a one ad. Oh, really? Yeah. And was, wow, Where was the place in Village Voice or something like I think that? It was at Sam Ash. I think it was at Sam Ash, which makes sense because they lived in Garrison Beach, which is right there. And um, so I think it was a one ad. I don't remember if it said Pearl Jam and Rage Against the Machine, maybe or something like that. It was a couple of, you know, bands, which is funny because we often fought over how much the brothers were not into Pearl Jam and me and Paul loved Pearl Jam. And like, <laughs> do a Pearl Jam song, like, it was a constant argument. Nobody wanted to do it. Um, <laughs> and then we started to do Paul Jam on the side, which was just me, Paul, and anybody that liked Pearl Jam. Uh, <laughs> So I answered the one ad and I remember I called Matt to this day, 718-753-4205. I still remember yeah. that guy from the one ad. And um, <laughs> we talked for two hours. I think we talked on the phone for like two hours and, you know, just super friendly, super fun. I was like, I like this guy. And a lot of times, you know, when you were answering the one ad, that wasn't the case. It was, mm-hmm. you know, it was a 17 year old that thought they were really, really cool. And, and playing it just super uptight. And yeah, I don't know. It was just such a weird scene. Uh, but these guys were really sweet and nice. I mean, Matt and I talked a few times. I came down. Uh, we did the songs. They, they played a few originals. I think I tried to, you know, improvise. I, I also was, I think I'm one of the few singers I've seen out there that have enough cojones to say, hey, I'm going to stand here and try and try and sing along with this song that I've never heard before. 
I'm going to make <laughs> some words about, I don't know, why did the chicken cross the road? Whatever it takes, let's just sing something, you know, and, mm -hmm. and get the jam going. I feel like a lot of singers were really too embarrassed to do that, that, you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to sing? It's going to sound stupid. And uh, so when they jammed and I was wet, ready and willing to jump in, I think that that was a good sign. And I don't remember them ever saying you're in the band. I think they just kept inviting me back. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it started and it started. And we were always, I think we started off, I remember us jamming a lot at Fast Lanes 2. You remember Fast Lanes 2 is the 36th in Quentin? Okay, right, right. And we were there a lot. And I think at some point we eventually just rent, rented the room from Mike every for the month. We, we chipped in for a monthly uh, rental of the room downstairs. And so that mm -hmm. was our room. I mean, you could go there at 2 o'clock in the morning. You had the keys. You unlock. You, you go in. It was a sweet deal. Um, and we would play for like four hours on a Wednesday or Thursday night you know, refining the songs, refining our performances of them. Um, we started writing right away. Uh, I thought that Danny in particular, but, you know, certainly Paul as well, um, wrote stuff that was interesting and made me want to sing. Like, and, and that really was a big thing for me. Do your songs make me want to sing? I, I had been in, in situations already where people would play me riffs and like, I don't know, man, it was just, they didn't understand that the vocals need to go somewhere. The vocals need to be somewhere in the song. It was just literally, diddly, 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 you know, the whole time for four minutes. And I don't know. I, I, I certainly, I was not into Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, or any of that. I wasn't looking to, to be in a band with any of those guys, you know, or types of guys. So finally, it was a band that seemed to understand that the, you know, people want to hear someone sing over, not simple music, but not not uh, progressive rock either it wasn't my thing so you know it, it, it started to flow really nicely and i think um i remember we wrote the dust and we wrote a song called the street and we wrote a song called not this way you know they were okay but when we hit everything you are and i could remember clearly i was working at beep america at the time and i played guitar but i didn't play guitar in the band and i could remember i called paul and i said hey could you just help me out real quick what are the chords in that chorus and over the phone, he's, you know, G, 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 and then, you know, he tells me the chords and I hung up the phone with him and I sat there and, and played the chords over and over to myself and started, um, you know, working out a melody. And then once I got to tell me what you wanted me to be, I was like, whoa, <laughs> all right, I think we've got something here. And I brought it back to them. And nine out of 10 times when I walked in there pumped, they reciprocated by being pumped there were a few times i was like woo and they were like mm. but a lot of times <laughs> they, they the energy was matched and so i think once we had that song we were all pretty uh you know clear that this was going to be something we, we we're going to keep doing this we we all love that so i mean to this day and i'm, and I'm very critical and 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 will constantly look back on my past uh, i i still think that that's objectively a good song i, I you know i, I feel that uh, yeah, that's yeah. a. I I I just want to jump in for a minute, uh, just to give you a little feedback yeah. on what you've given so far. That's all. That's all fun to hear. I can imagine how satisfying that is to like find a band that sounds good and that understands that your place is very important and uh, that they need to make space for you. You know, and um, that that could reciprocate your energy. That that's great. Uh, and that everything when you say everything you are, um, I probably would recognize many dirty mother nation songs but when you say that name i i could hear it so that's one song yeah. that i just like is in my head still yeah so <clears throat> I, mean, I can send you the guitar tab if you want john <laughs> <laughs> the second ball comes in with you know and a little rumbling bass thing it's great it's great so i think that was the first sign that we were onto something um i think when we wrote Lifeline, um, I've been thinking for, you know, uh, that was another one where I was like, okay, we're getting better now. Like, this is mm -hmm. better. Um, I think I Miss You uh, was a great song. And that was one that, you know, so this is my interview, right? <laughs> that was one that I particularly was proud of because I, I wrote the music for that. Whereas most of the time, um, we they were writing the music and I would have input 
and then I was writing the lyrics and the melodies. This one, I, I was sitting on a friend's couch and um, had the capo on. Is this okay during the show? Am I allowed to? Oh, yeah, sure. Am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> uh, I, I was at a friend's house, and we were literally just doing nothing, man, and just sitting around on the couch. And it was just like, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. And we're just chatting, and I'm like... Like, wait a minute, wait a minute, shh, <laughs> stop talking, stop talking. And then once I hit that, I was like, woof. I, I <laughs> ran home and I finished, I, I wrote like 75% of it, handed it over to them. And I remember uh, Sean came in with the bridge and he wrote a, a bridge that I was in, I was, I was mad that I didn't write the bridge. <laughs> uh, but when I heard it and I liked it, I was like, you, you got to be mature, you know, go <laughs> and you got to be mature. The best idea has to win. Or, you know, someone who has an idea. I didn't have I didn't have a bridge. Right. But when I think it was Paul and Sean kind of collaboratively, but I remember Sean in particular. Um, and then we added that in. I was like, this is this is a great song. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was just kind of those landmarks along the way that you know made us keep going. Uh, just quick side note, I do remember at one point I was so passionate about Lifeline and the melody of Lifeline, like the you know, really concentrating on how the melody is going to work with the song and how it sounds that I, I had a nightmare that I was singing it and, and the audience wasn't, uh, wasn't picking up the, the, how good the melody was. <laughs> like, I, you, like, I had a nightmare that like people just weren't getting it. And like mm. that, like, I cared that that melody in lifeline was so good. You know, like that's how much. Wow. I thought. Have yeah, you ever that's had That's another a song. That's another song I remember. Have you ever yeah. had a situation where you worked so hard on the vocal melody and you thought the line was so good and then somebody comes up to you after a show and goes, that guitar line is fantastic? <laughs> uh, not what you feel so mistaking it for, for not being mine, you mean? <laughs> uh, it was more, that more happened in the uh, studio, whereas I would sing something and, and I felt pretty good about it. And, and I think you can see from this interview, I'm pretty hard on myself. So if I do say I like something, it's probably been through the mill in my head 300,000 times. And then when someone else turns around and goes, mm, yeah, I, I would get viscerally, viscerally angry, you know, because <laughs> you feel passionate. Listen, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, they're like your children. They're like your babies. They're reflections of you in a lot of ways. And yeah. it's unhealthy because in a band situation, you have to sublimate that feeling and, and go with the group. But there were songs, and, and I would say that this was more towards the end, but it certainly was a, probably a contributing factor to it being the end. I wasn't enjoying what I was writing anymore. I wasn't liking what I was writing, and they did, actually. Like, there was like there was a specific song called Act Two, and it's still a joke. We, we still joke about it. Like, if we all get together for a drink, it's like, so how's the lyrics for Act Two coming along, Lonnie? Because mm -hmm. I just... I couldn't find my place in this song. I didn't like it. They liked it. They, they, you know, everybody else liked it and, and felt like what I was doing was cool and just finish it. And I couldn't, I just did not like it enough and feel about it enough. And when that happens enough times, people start getting irritated, you know? And so I think I started to get more uh, confident in saying, I don't want to do this song. I don't like this song. And then people who were writing the songs were getting annoyed that I didn't want to do it, you know, but you have to love what you're doing and feel passionate about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure Luke can relate to that a little bit. Am I putting words in your mouth, Lou, or does that sound a little familiar? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Once the passion starts going down the drain, it's, it's tough to rekindle. It's it's like the fire's out, and now you keep trying to re strike the fire, re strike the fire, and it's it, it's hard to get back from. It's hard to get back from. It is. it is. I think it was it was Paul mostly that wanted more input into the melodies. I think he felt like when he was writing the music, he had an idea of what he wanted sung, but he he and I like agree on so much and disagree on so much. <laughs> uh, so like there were times where he would do something and, and I would be like, Oh God, yes. Oof. Oh, I love you. And then other times he'd be like, you know, say something like, well, why don't you sing this over this? And I'd be like, you can't be serious. You, you must be <laughs> And you know, 
and then it gets nasty sometimes you know you, you start to get in, and, and i have a way sometimes of thinking that everyone realizes i'm joking and i i come across nastier than intended so i i know that about myself so i'm sure that that didn't help these conversations <laughs> um yeah, I, I, the other thing is, it's specific, I think we may have touched on this the other day, but I really, I, I don't like singing what the guitar is doing. Uh, right. mm -hmm. You should do something independent. And, and um, I think that sometimes, you know, that Paul being a Black Sabbath fan uh, really did like that style. That's a very Aussie thing to do is kind of match the riff, for, at least for a portion of the, of the riff. And, you know, it was a, just a difference in opinion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what years were you guys active? Um, I can't really place it. I know you guys had quite a run. Yeah. I think I can, I, I usually have to remember things by, by like memorable landmarks. So I remember I was in a relationship that ended pretty early in DMN days and that was around 2003. So maybe, maybe early 2003, it has to be something like that. Sounds right. And then when did it end? We were in Brazil in 2005. I've been with my wife now for about 10 years, and she and I were together at the beginning of Dirty Mother Nation. So I'm going to say 2008 or nine it ended, something like that. It had to be about five year run. Yeah, I was going to say in my mind it's like five or six years. Maybe that six year was thinking the the Sandy reunion or something. But yeah, does that sound right? Five. Yeah, five to six years. Yeah. Something like that. I think 2012, 12 or 13. Okay. 12. Yeah. yeah. And we had been, we were definitely not together for a while at that point. That, okay. Mm -hmm. I think we reunited for Paul's wedding. We reunited for Sandy. And then maybe there was one other Halloween party one time. Wow. Mm -hmm. You old, bro. So Daniel Douglas also <laughs> mentions uh, 2003 to 2008. Okay. I was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Three, four, five, six. Seven, Dr. Eight. Douglas, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. so about six, six years. Yes, thank you, Dan, for your input. <clears throat> and Danny, Danny is, uh, you know, I'm, I miss writing with Danny. Uh, I, I, I always have to say that, you know, whenever I talk to him, I tell him, I mean, he, he, he in particular brought something out of me that not many people have, and I can't really even get out of myself sometimes. You know, he, he would, you know, when Danny walked into the room with the bass line to the siren song, I was like blown away. I mean, just blown away. And I mean, that he, that, that dude used to have me running for a pen and paper. <laughs> Speaking of Daniel, way. have you heard uh, Nova Lantern? I have. I have. I love hearing Dan sing. I mean, Dan was really coming into his own vocally in Dirty Mother Nation, doing some backup vocals. I know it wasn't really comfortable for him. at the. It seemed to me it wasn't comfortable for him at that point. You know, not that he was good at it. I just think that he felt self-conscious about it. Um, but I always thought he did a really good job. He would cover the backup vocals when we did Sirens. And, and there have been times in retrospect where I'm like, man, why didn't I lean on Danny more? You know, instead of feeling frustrated or, you know, I'm not going to hit this, or I'm going to have trouble with that. Or, you know, Danny should have been singing more in Dirty Mother Nation, in my opinion. He, he should have been, you know, maybe doubling me on everything you are, choruses and, you know, other stuff like that. He He's a real talented guy, great, great bass player. And he's just like, a he's the right kind of musician because he's serious about it. He, he's, he's passionate about it. He listens to a lot of different things. He's influenced by a lot of different things. He's, he's not close-minded in his musicianship. And that's an important thing. Yeah. A lot of us uh, seem to have hit certain ceilings with certain things that we did. Cause uh, I, I worked with Daniel right after you. Yeah. I was in uh Varick's vanity with him and uh, Daniel was singing a little I, more than he was. I forgot. Yeah. And he was singing more than he was in dirty mother nation, but he still wasn't the singer. And yeah, uh, yeah they recently did a, uh, not, not so recent anymore, man, maybe I'm old too. Uh, they did Nova Lantern. They're on their second DP. And uh, yeah. his vocals mm -hmm. got pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought so too. Yeah. No, he's he's a really capable singer, songwriter, obviously brilliant guy in general. And, he's a doctor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about the name, but I, I said that the other day. <laughs> There's no good band names. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm I'm a comic book nerd too, so I, I get where the where the references are from. Maybe for that. If I wasn't from that world, maybe it would sound more interesting. Hmm. Nova Land. 
Yeah, I don't know. To me, I don't know what it's from, so I just thought it was cool. Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan. I think it's Nova from Marvel Comics and uh, obviously Green Lantern from DC. So <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong. All right. So uh, jump into some more questions here. Um, I, don't, I don't see any questions popping up from my watch party at the moment. If there's anything else on your end, Lou, let us know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to step back. We'll come back to the rock band, but just let's take a break sure. from it for a minute. Uh, can you think of one to two songs? Maybe we, you kind of covered it. Let's say Lonnie songs, just Lonnie Friedland songs. Yeah. One to two songs that you wrote that really reflect a certain moment in time or a period in your life or experience that you feel proud about, like to this day, like, man, that really, whether it's sad or happy or whatever, it's like, I'm glad yeah. I wrote that. That really captures a moment. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'll go back to, you know, I'm working at Beep America. It's like 2001 or 2002 and I'm writing songs, but you know, they suck. You know, it's an early batch of songs and they really aren't good. Um, my father passed away in March of 2001 and I was dealing with that, you know, badly. Uh, and then it was six months later, it was 9-11. You know, so for, for me, that, that time period was really, really strange and difficult. And um, it felt like I was in such deep mourning that it almost had to spread into the entire world. And that was what happened with 9-11. Like that was how I felt. I felt that I was so sad that I almost made the entire world sad. Uh, you know, as silly as it sounds, but it, it, it was, you know, a legitimate feeling at the time. Um, and I had written a song uh, called Without You about my about losing my dad and it was also about uh, a, a relationship that i was in ending it was the same relationship ending that was right before dirty mother nation starting um and i think that that to this day is one of the few songs that it's probably the oldest song that i've written that i still would pick up and perform for people i stand by it and so for me that song um it's just the fact that i still can feel that it's a powerful song and a well-written song and that it communicates what I was trying to feel. Uh, so to me, that, that is a milestone that, that to me, even though there were songs before it, that's, that's technically number one. That's the first, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, from there. Well, so hold on. I gotta uh, make you promise me that that will be on your album that you release that song. Okay. okay. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. And I've done it, I, and I think I, when Dirty Mother Nation never did it because it was, it's a pretty, you know, mellow song, and they didn't do that well. <laughs> uh, but there were times where we would do a show, and then maybe in between sets at the Monk, I would do, you know, a couple songs that include that one. So it's it's been out there for a few years. People have heard it, and and to this day, when people hear it, they're they're impacted by it, um, and that makes me proud. Um, I, I remember it. I remember that was a, a moving song. You remember that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think, um, you know, so outside of that, you know, there's just been a few songs along the way that, that make you realize you're on the right path. So there was a song, um, oh God, when you forget the name of your own song. <laughs> uh, That's the first thing to go. <laughs> give me a second. Give me a second. I'm, I, um, <laughs> oh shit well, anyway uh whatever it was called um <laughs> it, it was <laughs> so after dirty mother nation ended i i felt like do i know how to be a singer songwriter anymore I, i'm so divorced from that life that i don't know if i remember it and can i do it and can i can i write on my own and then when i wrote th this song i i felt like okay i still got it and I even remember my mom and, and, you know, we've discussed my, you know, my mom, you know, she was not, I'm not going to, she wasn't unsupportive, but she wasn't just, you know, she just wasn't into the music thing. She thought there was better things I could be doing. Um, she was like, that's a good song. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, 
whew, okay, I can still, I can still do it. So <laughs> I think that th those two kind of did it for me. Can you at least give us a little bit of the chorus, uh, if you can remember that, since you don't know yeah, the name of it? The song, I just don't remember what I called it. I can play the whole thing. It's, um, <clears throat> um, Time when I lost my mind, I found everyone around me blind, but I still had sight. Knew there was something more than we see, something that spurs a feeling in me that's so hard to define. And when I thought of how I was young and all the songs I've left unsung for good, I said, I'm not falling, I'm not searching on the floor for something more than what I have seen, what I used to be. Here, it's going to bring me back. Bring me back. Okay. <clears throat> Bring me back to life. Back to life. All right. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure I heard that. Maybe at, at the yeah, house cafe or something. And, uh, you know, probably in some way, every song is about my dad. It's just a, a, a the truth, you know. Somehow, some way, they all lead back to it. I think that one in particular was about like choosing not to be bad, choosing not to be down, choosing to be happy, choosing happiness and positivity for your life, as opposed to all the other choices you can make. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. I'm not searching on the floor for something more anymore. You know, that that's, you know, you know I'm tired mm -hmm. of down looking for something more. I, I, I'm, I'm ready to be more. Oh, beautiful. That brings us right into the philosophical portion of this episode. Ah, there you go. Nice. So what aspect of your life philosophy, Lonnie, helps you recover from setbacks? Yeah, these were the, so I read through your questions and, and if, if I immediately started answering it in my head, I, I stopped reading and <laughs> question. And if I didn't immediately get an answer in my head, I, I wrote some notes. So some of my philosophies that I think, uh, you know, have worked for me. Um, live and let live. It's nobody's job to tell other people what to do. You can't control other people. You know, you can influence you can help, you can advise, you can be a support system, but you can't do things for other people and you can't make other people do things, you know? And, and I think the sooner you learn that in life, the more relaxing your life will be, you know? Especially, I gotta say, as a parent now, this is something I observe in my kids a lot. So much frustration <laughs> around like, this one doesn't wanna play this game. She doesn't wanna go in the pool. Like, they are so, frequently frustrated by the inability to control other people <laughs> and you have to let that go you know you can't live your life expecting people to be something or, or do something that they're not um i think realism is, is is a big part of my life i try to be really really uh realistic about things and including my own problems right is this really that big of a problem is this a big problem for the world <laughs> or is this just a problem for me um, you know, and sometimes when you put things into that perspective, it helps. Um, I'm, I'm big on putting myself into other people's shoes at all times, right? So every situation you're in, I'll say it like this. I don't think that Hitler woke up in the morning and said to himself, boy, am I a bad guy and I'm going to do some bad stuff. People... Mm -hmm genuinely think that what they're doing is good. Now, obviously what Hitler did was terribly not good. Uh, but to him, he thought he was doing the right. So, so my, per my point is this, most of the people you're gonna meet in your life, 99.9% .9 of them, even when they're hurting you, 
they think they're doing something good or they're doing the right thing by either themselves or by someone else. And if you can try and stop and think about what the motivation is of the person that you feel has slighted you or hurt you, you might be able to see that it was never about you in the first place or their goal wasn't to hurt you. You know, their goal was something completely different. And I just think that the more you can do things like that, take yourself out of your own position, think about where other people are coming from and have a realistic idea of, of the world, you can move past some of the, the, the struggles you encounter. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So basically in that case, I would say uh, empathy, right? Sure. Certain, certainly compassion and, uh, yeah, and that, that uh, element of being trying to see with trying to see the truth with the realist part of it, like what's actually going on, you know, you're trying to, you know, parse that out from what our emotions might be. Well, emotions aren't necessarily good or bad, but what our, uh, let's say our egoic mind is telling us what the story it's creating, you know? Yeah. As opposed to that. Right. Yeah. So we do um, have a reaction in the comments from uh, Mark Hamill. He says Godwin's law. Godwin's law is the proposition that the longer an internet argument goes on, the higher the probability becomes that something or someone will be compared to Adolf Hitler. And also, <laughs> I, and also I really like his song and has a good voice. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah, I've heard that one. I, it, all, it all rolled me back to Hitler, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fine. Him well, and the, Jesus, right? The longer yeah. an internet conversation yeah. goes on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, was, I saw something, a video the other day. They were like, well, who are they comparing people to before Hitler? Like everything's like, you're like Hitler. What, what was the pre-Hitler comparison? Like Genghis Khan? Or... It, right. it like, had to have been something like that. Yeah, Napoleon was pretty bad, but he kind of gets a good image sometimes. So I don't know. Yeah, about... Heard he's so... taller, but then he gets credit for it. Well, I think Napoleon, <laughs> oh, yeah. he, he uh, accidentally discovered things, whereas the other guys kind of didn't. So like, you know, like we wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't have ancient Egypt if it weren't for Napoleon. Like there are a couple of decent things we can say, uh, uh, I guess we got something out of this. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> bad way of looking at it, but, you know, because none of them were nice guys. But, you know, at least we have ancient Egypt. But it, yeah. it's interesting when you research what the motivation was and then mm -hmm. how they're able to convince other people to see it that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's I mean. I'm Jewish. I, I have no sympathy for, for the Nazi party at all. Not even the slightest, not a minuscule amount, obviously, but it's still an interesting thing to understand from a psychological perspective and a sociological perspective. You know, people, people weren't walking around thinking that they were bad people doing bad things. They thought they were good people doing good things, helping, helping their country. You know, right. it's a, had he mm -hmm. come at a time when the country was doing well, maybe it would have been a total different, you know, situation, okay. but he he was the perfect guy at the perfect time to create that situation, unfortunately. And uh, it just shows you how easily something could be capitalized on. I was surprised to learn recently that the Nazi party was just one of many parties with very similar views. I, I, they happened to be the one that came to power. But apparently there was a lot of other parties that had very similar anti-Semitic uh, viewpoints and, you know, pro-Germany, you know, taking over the world viewpoints. So it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I, know, I, I didn't know that. Uh, and and this is way off. We're 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 so far off topic now. <laughs> uh, even if you want to take it down to the mis minuscule level of a band jamming in fast lanes too, you know, if someone's telling you that they don't like your melody, it's not because they're trying to hurt you. They woke up that day and was like, "Let's let's make Lonnie feel bad." They're trying to do what's best for the band, what's best for the song, and and um, you know, you gotta be mature about that and and respect that. So speaking of, we do have another question from a Dr. Daniel Douglas. He says, here's my question, which I probably won't hear the answer live. Albums usually pick up on themes from prior songs recordings. What song Dirty Mother Nation did toward the end do you think would have set the tone for the next record? Oof. His eyes yeah. just bulged. <laughs> uh, would have set the tone for the next record. So I, don't, I guess I'm, I'm wondering what what counts as as like like we had a song Eurydice at the end, and I think that that was our last great song. 
So I would say if that was the sign of things to come, then that was a good sign of things to come. That, that, that I think was us going to a different place with like some harmonized guitar lines, uh, kind of different uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus format. Um, so I, I would say that one. If, if, if Dirty Mother Nation could pick up from anywhere, I'd say we should pick up from there. But I don't know if that's late enough for Dan's question, if he likes that. Uh, there was some stuff that just wasn't really finished. Like it had weird names like the Tom Tom song, and, you know, mm -hmm. and A and stuff like that. So th that stuff I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, to, to So going back to the before, like there, I told you there was that one song that they all liked and, and I didn't really like. Uh, it was about a year ago. I, I said to Sean, I was like, do me a favor. If you have the, the naked tracks of that, send it to me and I'm going to write the vocal melody for it finally. <laughs> and I did write something that I never got around to sending it back to them. <laughs> you know what always yeah. amazed me about you guys? Um, seeing Sean bring a full half stack or a two by 12 and then yeah. watching Paul bring this tiny little 10 inch speaker. And <laughs> Paul was so loud. <laughs> it, Paul was so loud. It defied physics. You wouldn't think a 10 inch speaker can outpower a four by 12, but it did. <laughs> And, and he's such a sneaky bastard because you would be like, all right, we're good now, right? Everybody's good. This is the volume we're going to be at. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then slowly like. <laughs> Why know? do guitarists do that, man? It's, yeah, no I offense, know, Paul, John. but just it's a guitarist thing. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm kind of like the one guitarist who I probably try to do it too. I don't know. But uh, no, but usually the thing with me would be it's like, no, you can come up, man. I can't hear you, you know? I, I do understand that some guitar tones are better when the amp is, is louder. I, I understand that. Like I, I do, but Matt was really loud. I mean, Matt was a pretty muscular dude. He was half the show with drums. <laughs> Danny was very respectful, almost to the point where sometimes you wanted Danny to come up, but in, in the middle of that room where Paul and Matt are vying for loudness and then I'm trying to scream over it. I mean, I had earplugs in, I was standing by the monitor and I was still going home, you know, feeling destroyed at the end of every rehearsal and every gig. <laughs> and I remember it was Mike Ferrant, uh, the owner of Fast Lanes, Mike Ferraro, Ferraro. Mm -hmm. And I remember he, he was such a, you know, supportive guy. And if he thought your band was decent, he would be pretty, you know, nice about it. And he was like, you guys are good, but you, you could, let him sing. Let him sing, man. <laughs> People sing, and you guys are blasting him out of the water. Uh, but it never, it never sunk in. Even Matt, to the last gig we did, it never sunk. In. Matt was the only drummer I've ever worked with that hit the drums so hard his shirt just flew off every time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess maybe that's why we had so few, so many female fans. We had <laughs> we had acts of steel in the background. Acts of steel. I, I talked some crap about him, you know, two days ago when we were on, and then the next day my phone rings and it's mad. I'm like, oh god, <laughs> yo, are you mad? He's like, no, why? I'm like, oh, because I said something about you, you know, you and I arguing uh, on a podcast with John Henry. He's like, oh, I didn't get to hear it. I had no idea. So it was funny. He actually just happened to call and we were chatting the other day and yesterday. And <laughs> him I, I still love him I, I consider him one of my closest friends he's, he's a great 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 guy and paul too you know I, I i miss paul he's out in florida but we talk we talk every so often and he always makes me laugh i i mean he, he's just crazy and he's funny and he's talented and he's he he let me tell you he still believes that one day dirty mother nation is going to take over the world he hasn't let that go <laughs> And that's the, the guitar tabs, right? When yeah. that happens, yeah. level six will open up for you guys. <laughs> we'll be there. Yeah. Level six with Gabe, that was District, no, that, that was District 22. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you mentioned Varric's Vanity. I'm not trying to, to co-op your, your interview here. But you mentioned Varric's Vanity. That's that's funny to me. Um, <laughs> How's yeah. it funny? <laughs> it's, like, um, it's like talking uh, to, to your wife's new husband. Oh man, or your wife's second ex-husband. You know what I'm saying? Second like, ex is a better girl. term. We both dated the same girl, you know. Yep. Yeah. I did try. I remember, I, I remember it. I said, you know, Lonnie, you need to be a good friend. You're gonna go to the Varrick's Vanity show, and you're gonna show your support. And I took my wife, and we watched Varrick's Vanity play, and I smiled. <laughs> 
We uh, had but, um, we had our not. ex's current boyfriend on the show the last time. So Josh Salant was on. Oh, right, with Nova Lantern, right? Yeah, I love the Salant brothers, man. I love. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know them as well as everybody else, but I've met them a few times. There's also this contingency. I don't know if you've noticed. There's like this contingency of guys that are like maybe five or six years younger than us that thought we were really, really cool when we were gigging around. And now they still think we're cool. So I think Josh <laughs> kind of fall into that category of <laughs> cooler than we are because they mm-hmm. were at the time, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't met those younger guys, but uh, oh, I know Josh, <laughs> who's just a great guy. <laughs> Great guy, man. <laughs> uh, Barrack Vanity. I was, I was bitter. Mm-hmm. I was bitter. You know, even though Dirty Mother Nation was over, it, you know, it doesn't feel good. It still doesn't feel good to see everybody up there but you. You know, it, it, especially when you have all these like confidence issues that I'm talking about. You know, so it 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 hurt. Uh, not that they did anything wrong. That's not the point. You know, I was hurt, independent of anybody's intentions. Mm-hmm. Um, Man, but when it didn't work out, I was happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding about that part. Going um, by that no, logic, this, this, do you know mm-hmm. what, what John made me feel like? <laughs> oh, yeah? He went everywhere. Uh, so you know, many I was bands. Gonna, I was going to say the other day, every single time John popped up with a new band, I'd be sitting there like, never, not once did he ask me. I thought... <laughs> I thought I remember when it was uh, Gabe, when Gabe was in the front, and I used to go to like a lot of your rehearsals. You remember that? You used to sit there at your rehearsal every yeah, week. District 22 days, yeah. I it always was, think about you at that, that era. We, you were playing at Electric Plant almost every week, and I, you know, I didn't think I had much to do, and we used to just come and sit and watch you guys play. And I used to look at Gabe, and I, and I still see Gabe on Facebook, like, like Gabe, big fan of Gabe, great guy. But I, but I could do that. I could do that. Yeah, yeah. I missed his phone calls, too. Yeah, I, we must have missed them. I was, okay, next time he's gonna hit me up. He's gonna hit me up. <laughs> but that's was, funny. Now, I do remember. I was gonna say during the District Twenty Two, we had like District Twenty Two was a very unusual time period. It was very brief, but we had this really good band. I I, I felt and um, <clears throat> and great hangout sessions, right? And an Electric Plant, which which Lonnie, yeah. you were there sometimes and occasionally we would just put, go into jams if it was drinking and smoking going on or just, you know just jam and you grabbed the mic at least one time i can remember maybe more and you just like made stuff up like you said you do you know, you're not afraid to just go for it and i remember feeling that i'm like wow this guy just he's going for it and i felt that energy that yeah it must have came from like being a pearl jam fan or whatever type of free spirit kind of belting you know yeah, that yeah. you do and uh i i was i i guess that was right before uh dirty mother nation probably right yeah it was, yeah, it yeah. was. It was. so when that happened dirty mother nation I'm like okay good that makes sense you know that lonnie found a place yeah to no, showcase I mean, that Dave was amazing drummer i don't know if he still plays but he was to me i thought he was amazing and i thought nick was a great bass player uh it was a solid band that was a really solid band yeah, I like listening to those recordings today. You know, we don't have anything official, nothing online. Maybe I can twist I those guys' arms to put some stuff online. I'd like to hear it. Yeah. I uh, I remember you covering the cult of personality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you guys had a, like a real legit club and you had a nice stage out and you played that song and I was like, I was feeling you guys that night. You killed it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that was right at the right before i started getting well right when i started getting into effects pedals and stuff and then by the time level six uh co-opted me into their their little group um i was already had the pedal thing going on which is what they wanted level six wanted sonic strangeness to uh, their their thing so like quasi keyboard and uh i'd already developed that through the district 22 thing but modus tones which is before that it was just Clean tone distortion. That's all I use. You taught yeah. me how to be, how to very passively produce things because you didn't act, um, you didn't act accordingly to aggression. So I used to keep you up really late at night until you were literally getting like so tired you were just giving up. Remember when you we used to sit there though. with the laptop? You, you still do that. 
<laughs> and you used to go into different like mind dimensions, and that's when we used to, you know, get you to do exactly what we needed you to do. On the recordings. Oh yeah, yeah. I used to come to his house with an M box and a little laptop, and then we just used to. I used to keep him up all night. That's so funny. That it was, was fantastic. I miss it. Yeah. <laughs> Or, or in the Rockaway studio, we would do that mm-hmm. late into uh, the night. Yeah, You know, it, it's, you get into like a mindset when you're playing something or you're writing something. And then sometimes you get out of the mindset and you come back and it's a whole new world, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I love waking up in the morning and listening back to the MP3 player and, and hearing what I did the night before. And then immediately I'm like, oh, okay. I see where I'm stuck, but I got it now, you know, like. That whole different mindset changes things. And that's probably why you get a lot of musicians and creative people who fall into the trappings of, you know, drugs and excess. I think that that shifting mindset drives the creativity, but it hurts other things. Yeah. I think it it more so just shifts the perspective. It forces the perspective shift in real time rather than like what you're saying, listening back the next day. I think it just... uh, yeah, it accelerates the natural process of waiting it out and listening to it a day later and then saying, oh, okay, now I have a different idea, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and to that, like the the crazy, unpredictable, you know, schedule of a rock musician or a touring musician and, and the late nights and being in the clubs or if you're on tour, being in a van or dark hotel room, why wouldn't you, the lunacy of that lifestyle, why right. wouldn't you want to like escape for most right. people, right? And that's, that's not good, as we know. Yeah. And, and that's another thing I've thought about, you know, would I survive a rock and roll lifestyle? I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't right. know. I think some people would. I don't know if I'm one of them. Yeah, it's a real danger, for sure. Yeah. 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 I had another point, but I forget. Uh, so I want to ask, Lonnie, related to that question um, about your spiritual philosophy, uh, are there any setbacks that you'd feel comfortable to share in which you've learned a powerful life lesson if you haven't already mentioned it? Um, any setbacks? So I had a weird, uh, I don't know how much you want to get into it. I had a weird um, late teens, early 20s, right? So um, <clears throat> I had a very normal childhood, you know, super normal parents were married and grandparents were down the block and relatives were around and it was all super cool. Um, but in my late teens to my early twenties, we had a lot of weird, tragic things happen um, in a short amount of time. And I, 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 I kind of see my life as, you know, pre that time and post that time. Um, so, you know, I, I was 15 when my grandmother passed, which was hard because it was my first experience with death. Obviously, as a 39 year old adult, you, you look back and like people's grandparents die. You know, it, it's, it's a fact of life. But at the time that that brought me to my knees pretty hard. And then it was a short time after that, that my father had been diagnosed with cancer originally. And then pretty quickly, uh, he lost his leg to, to the disease. So that was all within a couple of years. And then it kind of seemed like things were going to be on an uptick for a while. And then uh, a couple of years later, it, it resurfaced. And this time he very quickly got sick and died. And um, so now that's two people out of the support system gone, right? Um, then my mother had a sister who died about a year after that, tragically, and she was very young. Uh, and then my dog died. <laughs> oh my god uh, yeah so and 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 then if it, it ended that era ended with my grandfather dying so this was like a seven year period where it went from you know there were like seven or eight of us in the family that were together on every holiday to it was just me my mom and my sister mm-hmm. and my sister moved out and got married so you come home and there were four people and a dog and it's just your mom on the couch crying um, and that was my life for a, a really long time. Um, so I, the story turns around. Okay. Um, you know, so this, this lasted for a while. And then, you know, there's other things that you don't even really think about until you're in the situation. Like, so what do we do now financially? 
my father wasn't a rich man. He never really had a, a, a super professional career where he was like leaving me some kind of, you know, anything inheritance. Um, so it was, so it wasn't even like, okay, I'm just going to like hunker down and really take care of myself. It was more like, I got to get out there and figure out what we're going to do. You know, how am I going to survive? So I ended up quitting school. And for me, that was one of the toughest decisions I'd ever made because I was a student. It was not like, well, you know, I jerked off all my life throughout school and got detention and whatever. Uh, and now whatever it was, I went from like national honor society, uh, graduating high school with honors to, I don't think I can afford the time or the money it takes to be a student. And so I dropped out of school and I was working in retail and I literally would just kind of sit there and I would look out the window and watch people walking by and I'd say, you know, Lonnie, you're going to, you're going to die this way. And this is going to be the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, that's that. Okay. Um, uh, but I used to bring the guitar to work with me. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to be here all day anyway, and they, they don't mind me bringing the guitar, I'm going to try and figure this thing out. And I learned how to play guitar in Beep America, <laughs> like sitting in Beep America in between customers. I learned how to play guitar. But the real epiphany uh, that, uh, and I know you like to keep this show positive and what, so the real epiphany was um, there just came a day and I don't know why, and I don't know how, but I, I, I had to just one day wake up and say, you know, your dad is dead. Everybody else you, you're thinking about, they're dead, but you're not, you're very much alive and you're young and you have a life and you have a future and you can choose to die or you can choose to live. And I chose to live. I was done. I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to live like that anymore. I didn't want to cry every day. I didn't want to be depressed every day. I didn't want to live and wallow in my sadness every day. And when I decided that I didn't want to do it and I started to make a plan, uh, I was able to get back to school. I got my job with T-Mobile. I've been with T-Mobile now for 16 years, corporate. You know, it's not a, you know, I'm not on the sales floor anymore. I thought I was dying on that sales floor, dude. I thought they were going to come in one day and just wheel me out. And um, I've been with T-Mobile for 16 years. I got promoted. I, I, I love what I do. I love the people I work with. And in a lot of ways, T-Mobile saved my life. And in a lot of ways, my friends and my support systems saved my life. But it was, it was, I, I, and I guess it goes back to that realism earlier, right? I had to be real with myself and say, this is a, I'm sorry, this is a fucked up situation, but you need to move on. And it's helped me since because I've had fucked up situations since. And I think I take a little bit less time nowadays to move on because we just got to move on. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, that's um, that's more of the st of your story than I've ever heard before. Uh, thanks for sharing. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah, I you know I knew bits and pieces about your father. Um, we you and I both share losing a father at a early age, uh, and um, writing a song. My first song that I kind of officially say felt like the first song I really wrote was "Daddy," even though I'd wrote and written other ones before that. Uh, singer songwriter songs, anyway. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, I imagine, tell me if this sounds right to you. I imagine it had something to do with your mother's love too. That kind of, kind of forced you to snap yourself out of it. Even though you, you're the one to snap yourself out of it. You probably sense that, you know, how can I let my mom down type of thing? Was that part of it? Yeah. Oh yeah, it is. It is. And, and, and being there for her, supporting her, recognizing, like at one point I had to say to me, you know, your mom's alive. You know, you might that, but your mom's alive and think about all the things you wish you could do with your dad and do it with your mom. Um, and then also like, uh, you know, and, and I've alluded to this before and, and it, I don't ever mean to sound deprecating, but you know, my mom's a real person. She's not, she's not a sugar coater, right? She's not gonna, you know, she's not just, she's super loving and supportive, but she's, she's real. And I do remember at one point we were a couple of years into morning and i and i remember her distinctly saying to me um not as funny as he used to be mm -hmm. and um it's it, it 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 upset me really deeply because that was a big part of who i am as a person i like to make people laugh 
be funny. And I'm like, look what you're doing. You know, you're, 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 you're dimming that light. And it didn't feel good. And it, and it, it was a moment that made me say, you know, not, not to try to be funny, but to try to be alive in the moment, mm -hmm. happy, um, communicate, you know, it, it was hard. It was, it was so hard, you know, uh, I don't even, you know, I, I, sometimes I think that this is my new brain and it's hard for me to even really, really remember what the old brain felt like and thought, uh, you know, so, uh, but, but I, you know, whatever I am now and whoever I am now, um, it's who I am now. Mm -hmm. I heard scientifically, uh, it's one of these, you know, talks I heard at some points explains that the cells in our body uh, you know, whether it's true or not, whatever, it sounds true to me. The cells in our body completely replicate every seven years. Sure, I've so, heard that. so essentially, you know, by the time you're 35, you're already like in your fifth carnation of this lifetime, you know, mm -hmm. and it makes sense because like when I, when we're talking about these older days and we really can't remember certain dates or details at all, or as I'm going through my old journals to write my story, I'm like, whoa. Who, you know, who was that guy? Or like you told Lou what he, what he said, was that? Right. Yeah. What Lou said to you about the Chris Cornell thing. Right. And I'm sure he, he had no memory of that. Right. Or Ooh. even, well, I can't did imagine a, what kind of brain would have created that, but I know, did. A, he was a different person. I did a lot of drinking back then. Like a lot. No, <laughs> even then that, even like late teen years, you were drinking a lot. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had that, um, oh. hot six pack of Miller always in the backpack. Do you remember that? Uh, Mike oh, Barris man. used to pick on me for that all the time. Miller, Miller high life was the that Miller. I, I, oh. I hoped my accent had at least, you know, kind of like neutralized somewhat <laughs> since leaving Brooklyn. But every time I get together with you guys on these shows, oh man, <laughs> it just reverts completely mm. back. Like even mm. heavier than I started the show with. <laughs> Or, or even the move. <laughs> At the end of the two hours, you'll be back in Brooklyn again. That's it. And yeah. it's going to take me five months to kind of like tame it down again. And then one night, we're back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't, I didn't get into drinking or doing any uh, brain expanding until uh, early 20s. So I was mm -hmm. pretty clear headed through my teens. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I, it is sometimes hard to even remember what motivated that person and you could feel it some i mean your brain is weird your brain changes over time like mm -hmm. like i remember like i used to get lost in my toys like for hours and hours and worlds and superheroes and this and I'm like and then it's like one day you, you're looking at the toys and like this doesn't do it i can't do it anymore i can't do it anymore. something just clicks it. yeah and and i think that 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 happens with a lot of things as you grow like you just you just can't do it anymore, you know? And, and that's always my fear with the songwriting, right? But every time I, I psych myself out, I manage to get it back again. So I think that one will stick. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's... Second, uh, this dog, I think, is anxious. He wants to say hi to us. <laughs> hey! hey. Give me two seconds. Sure, no problem. <laughs> so uh, how, how's... Uh... How's the weather over there by you today? Oh Lou? man, finally caught up with everything. At least I believe I did. Um, we caught up with the comments. Everything's running well. The Facebook settings were shifted. People got the links. They got the links to uh, Dirty Mother Nation. Um, so Mark, I constantly drop for him all the time. Mark from the After Hours show kind of walked me through a few things, sent me some tips in the middle of it. So yeah, I was just doing a lot of bouncing around. Uh, this is the first... This is the first time we've went live and literally uh, everything hit the fan, so to say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we got through it. Um, what I would recommend, while I do have your ear, John, is that we do an intro similar to the cafe. Okay. So that mm -hmm. next time we can run that, um, do all the technical stuff we have to get done with, and then we can just flick in to go live. I'm admitting mm -hmm. in front of anyone who watches all of my feeds that the whole reason there's an intro in the other one is so that I can literally just check everything <laughs> <laughs> and then go live the second they've done this. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we should work on an intro. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, uh, and intro intros are nice. <clears throat> um, so just on that last note about how our brains change and stuff, <clears throat> um, 
I just took a trip to Scranton. Uh, why Scranton? Well, we had family up there to visit and whatever. So we went to Scranton. And um, did you go to Dunder Mifflin? No. What is that? You didn't go to Dunder Mifflin. No. Famous paper company. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's from Scranton. <laughs> Um, apparently the Houdini museum's up there, but we didn't go, but anyway, um, Scranton, it was what? nice to be there. It was cool. I, mean, I liked the vibe. Anyway, um, there was a record shop that had used, uh, used and new records. It had a lot of old VHS tapes. It had, um, tons of CDs and had cassette tapes. And I was a cassette tape guy. I had a huge collection. So I've been fantasizing. I spent a lot of time in my garage and, uh, I'm doing my autobiography there when, in during the warm weather. And I only have a handful of cassettes left. I gave them away or threw them out over the years. And I've been fantasizing just to grow the collection again, just for fun, you know, like on eBay or something. But I'm like, I really don't have any money to spend. on. It's very silly to do that. But if the chance should arise. So anyway, at this record shop, $2 a cassette. So I just went nuts. I spent 100 bucks. I got 48 oh new cassettes. God. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't ever spend money on clothes. I don't spend money on much so i just thought i would do it like like yeah. the old days and then it took me three days no let's say i did that on uh let's say saturday i think i did that i didn't look at the cassettes until today and what's today's thursday just couldn't do it just couldn't even open the bags because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter you know what's well, the old mojo for it yeah i mean it's like i'm glad i got them i don't regret it. i don't feel right. bad about it but there's just I remember I used to like track down Pearl Jam singles and imports yes. and European and like, and now like, uh, I'm like, why? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it just like, I don't know, especially there's something in your early teens and twenties where it's like a mixture of you're, you're almost an adult, but you still believe in magic to some capacity. And I don't believe, you know, not like hocus pocus, but like, there's meaning in the world, there's purpose, there's a greater power, you know, all these things are so, everything's so important still when you're, when you're 15. And for me, like, I need to know everything this band did. I need it. It has to be. And then you listen to it and you're like, why not? Why? That was a lot of money and time. <laughs> not a lot of payoff, you know, or like I used to collect Superman stuff and now I have all this Superman stuff. What am I going to do with this? I have a wife and kids. They don't want to look at my Superman stuff. What am I hanging in the kitchen? Right. <laughs> Speaking of, yeah. I, I think I had, we, me and my brother had gotten something like maybe 16, 17 different bootleg Pearl Jam records, like from back then. And we had numerous of Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, like all the live shows. And Faith No More, I still have a great number of live shows that were taken from them too. Yeah, I, I remember that. We used to just hunt them down. Go to Zigzag, right? Yup, on Avenue U. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like $25 for a bootleg or sometimes more depending on what it was. And yep. <laughs> I, I remember going to like tower records or Sam Ash and I would have like 10 CDs in my hand. So you're talking that's 80, 90 bucks alone right there. Right. And it was no sweat off my brow. I mean, if I, if I had the money, then that's what I wanted to spend it on. Yeah. And now it's literally every single thing is in my phone. You know, it's all on Spotify. Yeah. So, that? so like, Lonnie, I, yeah. Just for you. I'm going to show oh, you this right here. <laughs> right? So, do you know how Nothing Man has a very vinyl sound to it? Right off the bat, it's kind of swirly and it comes in and out of pitch and stuff. If you yeah. listen to Vitology, not, uh, Nothing Man, on vinyl, it yeah. swirls at double the pace. So, you really? really feel like there's something wrong with your table or your vinyl. Yep. <laughs> And then, I've and then never, right after it, whipping comes on, and you realize there was nothing wrong with it. I, I've never done the vinyl thing. I've always kind of scoffed at the people who were super obsessed with vinyl. Like, it, it just seems like a whole lot of work and energy to. I could <laughs> put it up on Spotify, man. Like, <laughs> gotta have a record player and what, like headphones or big speakers. You know, I I want to drive and listen. You know, but. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe there is something to the vinyl. Um, I, I've done it for, for the same reason John says, and, and the same reason that I found over like 40 years, there's a certain amount of songs that I always go back to, no matter what. And I feel mm. like for the nostalgia and just for the culture of it, 
You know, the one great thing that happens now when you're not stuck in the new modern world of like loading up a single on iTunes is that you're forced to listen to the album. You know, now everything's a single release. And yeah. and if you can't get through the song, you could just throw on a different artist. When you yeah. have a turntable out and that's spinning, a lot of the times you're just going to leave it spinning and it forces yeah. you to listen to the whole thing and really take in the vibe. So I just collect things like I have uh, the Frank Sinatra collection, of course. I'm an Italian from Brooklyn. And uh, I got some Pearl Jam. I got Soundgarden albums. Like just uh -huh. the specific ones that I say throughout all the years, I never got tired of these. Right. Just so that I have right. something in my hand. Because an MP3 just doesn't feel like you have yeah. anything. You know, you have I nothing agree. to show but a hard drive. Uh, I'm just on principle, I go out and buy every Pearl Jam CD when it comes out. Because I, I just feel like it's, I've been doing it since I was 14 or whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. But, but to your, you know, to your other point about like albums, I can remember just standing in the, in these stores and I would have something like bad motor finger and super unknown in my hands. And I'd be mm -hmm. in the backs and I'd be like, well, outside is the greatest song of all time, but I don't know any of these other songs. This one's got black hole sun fell on black days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and then like just kind of like pouring over these albums for days because it was so hard to choose and money was not growing on trees. And like, you know, my parents didn't want to hand me a hundred dollars every time I went to Sam Ash. Um, and so now when I have the ability to go, yeah, exactly. So now when I have Spotify, sometimes I, I feel like I'm not even using it to its fullest extent because if I had Spotify when I was 15, I don't it would have been like an endless amount of listening. And now I find I keep going back to the same 10 or 15 bands. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll explain a little bit how I feel about Spotify and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, so I'm on Spotify and I sort of try to build my following, but I, I don't believe in it that much. So it's weird, you know, but I know I have to be out there on all the streaming platforms. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. There's Deezer. There's, there's so many. We'll be on uh, all but... of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very nice. Um, but, uh, so here's my thing. Um, this I don't, I don't know if it's my own concept or whatever, but the reason I like cassettes and CDs, and I just made up a batch of CDs in my uh, most recent album that I released to mainly hand out or, or if someone contributes to my tip jar to give out. Um, because I want people to have hold a piece of me. If they, you know, they, they see it, it's there, it's in your hand. You know, this is my uh, old one, but, you know, it's like... There it is. You know, you grab it. It's like, oh, this is a piece of John, John's life. And, it, and then it becomes a piece of your life or whoever's life it is if they're holding it. Sure. And the Spotify thing is very amorphous, you know, and like yeah. just intangible. Also, it's a closed system. So if I put this on or Vitology or whatever it is, that's all I'm going to get. And right. there's going to be no ads. And not only is there going to be no interference, there's going to be no dings from my phone saying, you know, someone called. There's also going to be no Wi-Fi. Um, there's going to be no uh, wireless um, waves going through the air and zapping me. And I, I found out that I'm electro hypersensitive. And I think we all are to a certain degree, but there's so much uh, electro smog from all the various uh, wireless devices in the world that if I could turn mine off and actually just sit and listen to music and just get the electricity from the record player or from the CD player, that's, that's all in my field. I could really listen to them. Remember back in the day, you listen to the music. You know? Yeah, I, I would say that is that I, I mean, I like I remember getting Vitology for Christmas, saying to everybody, "A bye bye," going to my room, getting my walk, getting my headphones, and sat there until it was done. <laughs> right. Sat there until it was halfway, turned it over, and then sat sat there until it was done. Awesome. And I, I haven't done that in so. So recently, I just did some work on the house. If you saw, um, I did the floor in the basement. And Pearl Jam came out with a new album, maybe like three months ago, like right at the beginning of quarantine. And I told my wife, I said, you know what? Um, I'm not gonna listen to anything of, on this album until I get a chance to listen to it as a whole. And when I was doing the floor, I said, you know what? This is it. I, I, I picked up my tools, I got to work. I said, you know, Alexa, play Gigaton by Pearl Jam. And just listen to the album for the first time like that. And it was it was the first time in, in a really long time, I. Just listen. I mean, I was still working, so it wasn't a hundred percent just listening. But um, I do miss those days where the only thing I was doing at that moment was listening to music. 
Yeah, a funny thing when I when I was showed Kai, my son, the uh, cassette tapes I bought, he was into it. Like he likes he likes organizing things, so I would take one out. I bought forty eight of them and be like, you know, put it in place, and we like yeah. mapped it. I got forty eight, so a lo- I did a row of seven and a row of seven, so seven by seven is forty nine. So there was one missing that bothered yeah. him. He's like, oh, where's that? Oh, there's the other one. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, and so he liked the cover. He's like, oh, that cover's beautiful, right? And then we we lined them up as dominoes and we, you know, made them fall and then we did it again. Let's do it again. But anyway, so then he goes, "Um, what are these, daddy? And I'm like, this is uh, music you can listen to. He goes, you mean they're not movies? I said, no. (laughs) And he was a little less excited. And I realized like, wow, he he assumes everything is going to have a movie to it also, (laughs) you know? Right. He doesn't think, I mean, he loves music, so he doesn't need it really, but but he kind of assumed that, of course, it's going to be video that I, that goes with this. Even Spotify shows stuff now, like you know, facts and stuff about the song. Yeah, there, there's no there's no room for boredom in this world. <laughs> you know, because boredom, I think, leads to creativity and ingenuity. But there's no space for it. You can't do anything. Everything in this world is done passively. You watch TV while playing with your phone. You listen to music while you're driving. You you know not, nothing is done with full attention anymore. And I don't I don't know if we brought this up the other day, but even like what I noticed about my kids, um, we'll watch one of their movies. You hit play immediately. Someone's on the screen doing something, and you're you're into the movie. But every time I tell them, hey, let me show you something from when I was a kid. Let's watch The Goonies. Let's watch um, you know Monster Squad, whatever, and any you know something cool that they Monster might enjoy. Squad yeah, from when we were kids. Uh, seven minutes in, they're still showing credit. They're still playing the theme. Right. <laughs> they're like, what is this? this is you know, and I, I noticed that that nowadays the movies kick right. In. Pay attention now; you're gonna see these movies kick right in. And then if you go to put on anything from the '80s, you get seven minutes of like an, the water moving, the, <laughs> the song is playing, the the line producer, the sound producer. The, you know, they mm-hmm. don't do that. They don't do that anymore because no one has patience. There's no time to be bored. Yeah, I know. And I don't want to lament the old days like they were better or anything, but I, I do uh, sense that um, that lack of uh, patience. Uh, you could also say lack of um, endurance almost. You know? Substance. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. But, but like, you're, well, you're right because they're, they actually don't, they're, they're worse at being bored. So we were so bored that we were good at it. Like my mom would take me shopping and we'd be in Macy's for three hours and I managed not to burn the building down. But ask mm-hmm. my kids to just spend like five minutes, maybe we can have a conversation even as a family. And it's like, you're you're killing them. You're killing them. <laughs> and why are you so cool? You know, like they 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 don't know. And, and you're right, I don't, I don't believe in lamenting the last year. I think every generation looks at the next generation and complains about it. It's such a cliche. But I do think that, you know, we're, we're doing something to attention spans. Well, mm-hmm. there definitely is a, a difference. You know, uh, me and John have spoken about it a bunch of times. And, uh, you know, on my other show, we've spoken about it a bunch of times that like in the last hundred years, technology has changed so much. It's not like the previous thousands of years where everyone was like, oh, my son doesn't want to listen to me. And, you know, he doesn't understand. And then now we legitimately have different lives. Like we didn't grow up with an iPad and an iPhone and ear pods that were stuck to us all day long, you know, and now our kids have that and our parents definitely didn't have that. If they had a cell phone, it was like walking around with a brick. What is going to be the long-term ramification of having the answer to every question in the world and access to every adult site in the world, in your pocket from the time you're, you're born? Even if they don't have a cell phone that they take with them when they leave the house, if you have that iPad that's in the house, Google's on it. They could ask anything. Now, the beauty I think is that they could ask any question they want. Right. You know, what what is the sun? Why are there stars? That's that's an amazing thing that any kid could do, as opposed to asking somebody who maybe doesn't know the answer and doesn't have patience for them. That's a beautiful thing. But at the same time, I do think um, that's not what they're using it for a lot of times. They're using it for watching people play with toys, which I don't get. Why not just play with toys? <laughs> um, and then I, I do worry about, you know, 
when you hit that puberty age, that Pandora's box is really hard to keep closed. And knowing that anything you want to see is a click away, I don't know how to balance that. I didn't have that at my age. So I don't know how I'm going to deal with having a 13-year-old boy who's probably going to have a phone in his pocket. And how do I shield him from, you know, learning what every possibility out there is? You know, are you catching what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying not to be explicit. But there's a lot out there. Lonnie, and, sure, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm here to tell you that if this makes you feel any better, you are not alone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I am in that yeah. situation. Just flip it. A female at 13 yeah. right now. And I am in that exact situation (laughs) um i don't i'm not prudish and i believe in open communication we had a very open communication in my home um you know if i had a a question about sex or human sexuality or whatever it was i had the type of situation at home where i felt very comfortable going to my parents and, and saying this is my question what is this and what's it all about um not not a lot of people have that. My wife did not have that and, and has an amazing family life. They just, that's just wasn't part of their DNA. We don't talk about that together. That's just not what we do. <laughs> Where, you know, my mom would be like, so, you know, just want to make sure you have, you know, your sex life is good, right? You know, you're having, you know, good sex life. Like they go, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to know that. Uh, and, and that might be bizarre to people, but I think it was kind of, good you know that we were able to speak so my point being when the time comes it's not like uh, i'm super uptight and i'm not willing to talk but uh, they might start looking before they start asking right the problem is you can't kind of lean into it you can't you can't trust that they'll learn slowly so you can kind of ease into it slowly and it's a learning curve for the both of you now the door just slams wide open whenever it does and when they discover this stuff, it's just a gigantic wealth of here is the entirety of the entire thing right in your face right now. And, yeah. and there's no, there's no time to brace for it. It's just like, <laughs> just sex. I mean, you, as a parent, uh, you, you, I feel like part of my job, maybe you don't, but by part of my job, I feel I want to maintain that innocence as long as I can. Yes. The innocence is beautiful. Uh, That was some of the best times of my life. So for however long I can keep them innocent, I want to. And so even if it's not about, even if it's just about the atrocities of the world, um, you know, you learn about the Holocaust, but, you know, you could pick up your phone and you could see pictures. You could really see what happens or you could see what's going on in the world right now in places like Turkey or, you know, other places or, you know, you're hearing about, uh, you know, Muslims being imprisoned in in China and the, the world has some, true ugliness to it and i think the longer you can go without seeing that the better but i don't know how to how you do that in a world where this thing's always in your pocket and you could look at whatever you want well i'll just uh, chime in yeah great points guys um we're we're at 703 just just a warning we should wrap it up soon um what i would just add to that is uh i mean my my instinct i know you guys are a little bit deeper into parenthood than i am Um, but, um, you'll get there is, is just to really, to limit, you know, phone rules have to be established young. So uh, whatever my, my philosophy would be to limit that as much as possible and have long explanation as to why, and then demonstrate my own behavior, limiting my own phone use and, you know, to the best of my ability, because, uh, not only the, the access to all this information, which is definitely not necessary for young minds. But also, uh, I'm I'm really strong believer in uh, the dangers of uh, radiation, and there's a lot a lot of information about people. And I I was getting like heart palpitations and like serious chest problems toward, in February, and when I started turning my phone off and putting in airplane <clears throat> mode, and uh, being res- responding to things less, I began to feel better. And with 5G coming along, you know, it's a whole conversation. But uh, just really limiting the amount of technology we let into our lives in terms of like uh if each you know bluetooth and and the the uh, wi-fi and then the antenna terrestrial rate satellite the antenna on our phone we have three sources just on our phone of uh, that are emitting radiation so 
if we could, they're like bumblebees in the room. You could have one in the room and just kind of keep your eye on it. But if you have three or if you have 10 or 11, it's a little scary. So That's I just try to right. limit, yeah, the amount of well, bumblebees in my, in my room. Well, if I can, if I can mention this to you, John, um, uh, the one thing that you will get presented by, I mean, your son's still young, that, that kind of creates a seesaw and, and it becomes a very difficult thing to deal with is that you have to keep in mind the implications that you're doing to your child's future if you take the technology away, right? So we can't predict where we're going to be technologically or where jobs will be when they're older, but we're we're starting to understand now that just like we are completely, you know, really stuck with our technology, we can't get through anything without it, their future might be even more inundated by it. So you know, you, you'll get to this point where you have to kind of figure out, you know, on an individualist basis, like, you know, I'm having issues with one daughter that I'm not having with the other when it comes to technology. But if I take it away, not that I can ruin their future, but the the more they get comfortable with the technology and get better at it, the better chance they're going to function in society going forward. So because like uh, right now, all school kids have Chromebooks. We didn't see this pandemic coming. So now they're going to be online all the time, which is why even my eight-year-old has a Chromebook. So their their lives are literally just evolving with technology. Like we're almost cyborgs. <laughs> the phone well, is only I, detached when we leave it in another room. You know, look, technology doesn't go back. Technology right. goes, so it's not going to shift back. I mean, I would say give paper another 20, 30 years and there's just going to be disposable and enough technology where you could just write on a, a screen for a second and then toss it in the garbage. I think writing in general will probably be obsolete. It'll all be, you know, keyboard driven at, at some point. Um, so I agree. I agree with Luke. You know, the other thing is that I'm, I'm, I'm in a very unique situation on this topic because music is music is music. I've been with T-Mobile now in some capacity or another for 20 years. I've been 16 years with T-Mobile Corporate. Before that, I was in the store selling cell phones for four years. So this is, um, it's almost, uh, since 2000, uh, since 2000, I, I've been in the cellular industry. Um, you know, so I, you know, I have my feelings on, on, on all that. People used to ask me in the store, you know, like, what about the radiation? It was only early on that people asked that. That was very early in the game, like late 90s, early 2000s. People, you know, what about the radiation? my job was to be a salesperson. So my answer was, well, you know, you come back and, and look for me. And if I got a big lump in my head, you'll know we're in trouble. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a funny joke, but it, it goes to sale. Um, <laughs> well, uh, that, at least you, you, you weren't just a denier. You, you kind of said, yeah. okay, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I'm in it too. You know, That's still my answer. I mean, look, I, I think nothing is risk-free. Um, anything with radiation is not great. I try not to keep my phone too close to my testicles. Um, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, you have people in Britain attacking people, uh, men that are installing 5G. And like, I think that that's also a little bit crazy. Like, I don't think 5G is going to be killing people. I don't think it's it, it's that serious. Should it be looked at and measured and, and tested? And, and should we be sure 100 bazillion percent? I just think some people take it to a, a weird level. I think, you know, you sound moderate about it. You put it on, you know, you, you, there's time with it, there's time without it. You know, you, you, you're sensitive to it. You put it on airplane mode. That's great. I, I just think people sometimes get a little extreme with it where like, you know, 5G is going to kill people or brainwash you. And it's like, come on, come on. Well, I, I think, I think the, the problem that they really ran into with the 5G was that they, they didn't answer any questions. So, they never ran any official trials and they never, they didn't have enough experiments. And um, when a lot of the public were asking for the experiments, they still didn't get them, but the polls went up. So, so we did get the 5G. It might not be turned on everywhere yet, but mm -hmm. we did get the 5G, but we didn't get the tests. And I think that's, that's more of a matter of control. I think it was more of a matter of who do I speak to to get the information about this because. Some people like John do get physical reactions and yeah. you can't, I don't know if we've evolved at the same pace as the technology. So you can say maybe after 200 years, the amount of radiation that comes from 4G will, will, will not 
is affecting us less. So now 5G will kind of be like when we turned 4G on. I don't think human evolutions matched with the same timing. So I think a lot of people are just really concerned because of the lack of tests. Yeah. And I think my most honest answer would be, I just don't know enough about it to, to say, right. Um, you know, and I don't really want to, first of all, I'm not a spokesperson for T-Mobile, so I can't be, you know, so I'm not going to try to be, um, uh, you know, we're always trying to find the next big thing. You want to be the fastest. People want their service. They want, they, they, the whole thing is being connected at all times. That's what people want. You know, whether we think it's a good idea or a bad idea, philosophically, um, you know, people want that, that connection. They want that connection to be fast. And then the, the other part of it is not just having the connection, but look at what phones do now versus what they did. And that's just going to keep expanding. They're you a know, part so, of us. And yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's my socializing. It's my visual entertainment. It's my audio entertainment. It's my game entertainment. It's, it's my, um, I, I write my thoughts for my songs in here. I record my songs onto here. Um, you know, so. On, it, it's, it, on it's one hand, tell yeah. me how many phone numbers you still remember. <laughs> I remember Pat. I, I read that one before. I know my wife's, my mom's, maybe 20 or 30. But really, you know, wow, that's a yeah. lot. So, I mean, it's the numbers that I've known for a long time now, you know, it's and I, never and I don't want you to feel pressured. I didn't, I didn't give that little, uh, that little explanation there to kind of drill you about it or anything like that. I was just trying to defend people that kind of, you know, no, are worried. I want to be about careful. It. I don't want, uh, I don't want to be misconstrued as, as speaking on behalf of my company because that's a, yeah. a, a a dangerous line for me. I, you know, it's not my job to be doing that and I can't do it. Um, I, I just, I don't know. Maybe I, I just don't, uh, if, if the guy with the tinfoil hat is on one end of the spectrum, I'm all the way at the other end of the spectrum and, and probably I should be more close to the middle, but I just tend to, I don't pay attention to things like that, but it doesn't affect me physically like it affects John. So it's easy for me to say. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I don't want to uh, argue any points. Uh, I just, that's just my genuine feeling about radiation. And I've, I've read six books about it already, tons of videos and my own personal experience. So I can't yeah. not say it, but yeah. uh, by all means, we all have our own journey and you know, what's real for you is what's real for you. And you know, that's goes for each one of us. <clears throat> so it ends on a high note. Um, so Lonnie, uh, two more things. I want to know about your, uh, uh, your immediate plans, meaning for the rest of the year, uh, any musical plans, you could non-musical, it's fine. And, um, just kind of like if, if you could sp speak to anyone out there who's discouraged by this whole lockdown or just in general, maybe depressed or whatever to really give them something to, to take away, that would be encouraging or positive. What, what would that be? Yeah. Uh, so I had a computer that I used for recording music and it decided to die. It was done being alive, I guess. Uh, so my, my immediate musical plan is that I want to get a new setup here and I want to actually start finishing songs. So what happened was when I got this computer, a friend of mine helped me put it all together and he gave me like a, a reason a whole reason package, uh, reason, you know, the company, mm -hmm. uh, or it, it had just like every instrumental sound you could imagine, all the drums you could imagine. And then, um, I was using Reaper to, to record. I, I kind of feel like I had so many color palettes in front of me that I, I, I didn't even know how to paint. It was too much. It was too much. It was too much. So I think that what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get uh, just a pretty basic recording computer. And I actually heard you guys talking about it on your on your podcast last night, so I might pick your brain, Luke. Sure. About computers and stuff. Um, just want to get something basic. I think I'm just going to download something like Reaper, a pretty basic DAW, and I want to start getting songs out there. And, and I'm not sure if I'm even going to allow myself to put a keyboard even in the room or if I'm just going to do it. So I, because once it's there, I lose my mind. Uh, and I just might just do acoustic. I don't know if it's just going to be like guitar and vocals, maybe a little light percussion, but it's going to be pretty stripped. You know, this is my, is my plan. And I basically just want to start recording songs. I want to be able to 
you know, say, you know, oh, you've never heard my music. Here you go. Whereas at this point, I can't I can pick up the guitar, but I can't really hand you anything or send you anything. So that that's my immediate plan. Uh, but, you know, these things are expensive and you have kids and stuff. So you end up buying toys and clothes for them instead of stuff for yourself. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of somebody, you know, it, I may not be the best person to ask. Because like I said, I'm, I could do this for the rest of my life. Uh, I don't really get bored. I, I, I enjoy being home and, and being surrounded by my things. And if, you know, one of you know, talk about the phones, I have the Libby app, which is the library app. And you have a library card and you just download books to your phone all day and read free books. And, um, wow. you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I could, I could do that for the rest of my life. Um, but you know, I'll say this. Decide that you want to be happy and then think about what that looks like. And, you know, I believe in visualization. I believe in visualizing your goals and, 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 you know, if you want to run a race, I think you close your eyes and you picture yourself running in that race. I think, you know, if you want to climb a mountain, you close your eyes and, and, and that's the first step. So I think if you're feeling that this is not working for you and you're not happy, I think you got to think about being happy and what that means for you. Um, and I think you, you got to take care of yourself and, and go after the things you want. And, and then maybe contrary to that advice is I think some of the, the, the most frustrating things I've ever done is like try to chase being happy. It doesn't usually work. I, I think sometimes you kind of have to forget about being happy almost and just do what you want to do and then realize that you're happy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because when you chase mm -hmm. happy, like you ever like, you ever like, I don't know, but like maybe your wife goes out for the night and the kids are sleeping and you're like, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a nice scotch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab my guitar. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to, and then you do it and you're like, I think I'm just going to watch a movie. You know, like, like you, you do this whole plan and then it doesn't feel as good as you want it to. So sometimes like the, maybe just just don't don't focus on it so much. Focus on on doing stuff that you enjoy and that brings you joy and, and the happiness will follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nicely said. Those might yeah. be two contradictory paths, but maybe try both. Let me know how you like. <laughs> well put. Yeah, cool. So, um. This has been a pleasure. I want to, you know, honor your time there here, Lonnie. Uh, it's seven seventeen. Um, so thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast for one official episode and one sort of unofficial episode, which will both air for the uh, public consumption okay. to learn and benefit from. Love and it. thanks, and thank you, Lou, for uh, of course for your support. Thank you. I can't believe we did four hours. I still feel like we could talk. I yeah. know. I'm sure we can. 